Well, good morning, Harvest. How's everybody doing on our Happy New Year, January 2nd kind of day? Great. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> we are so glad you guys all made it today uh, and are, are here to join with us in worship and, and prayer. Uh, and I know we've all kind of got our New Year's resolutions. Uh, maybe some of us have to you know, be in the Word more and to pray more. And so why don't we just go ahead and kick off today with a little word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today and this chance to gather with you and commune with you and just be one with you. Lord, it might be New Year's for us and we might be setting all these, these new things and talking about new beginnings, but Lord, we know that you are the same yesterday as you are today and what you will be tomorrow. And Lord, we pray that you would just uh, open our hearts and our minds so that we can hear you. In your name, amen. You guys go ahead and turn around and say hi to one another.
All right, guys, we are so happy again that you are here. We're going to go ahead and uh, keep going with worship. Worship His holy 
seated. Well, good morning and happy new year. This is the time in our service where we get to stop and we get to share in communion. And so before we do that, I, I wanted to share a, a thought that I'd had this, this past week. Um, Around Christmas time, we typically set up a jigsaw puzzle at our home, and, and so uh, this year was no different than, than in the past, where we've, we've set one up and we start putting it together. And this year, it happened to be um, Charlie Brown and the Peanuts Christmas, so most of the characters are 
people that I've seen before, and you know, I, I sometimes have a hard time with uh, changes in color, going from one color to another, so I don't see those real well. Stacy did a great job this year. She got one that I could actually tell the different colors. And so we're, we're putting that together over the course of the, this past week, and I think it was probably Wednesday or Thursday night, I ended up staying up to about one in the morning working on it. I don't know if you guys are like that when you work on puzzles. You, you work on them for a little bit, and then you kind of get tired, and you got to go away, and you got to come back you know, at a different time, a different frame of mind. But for myself, I was, I was bound to determine I was going to get the light blue, which was the lower portion of the, the puzzle. I was going to get the border done. And as you know, border pieces, they're not that difficult to find. They're pretty, they all always have a solid edge. So we had separated out all the, I, I had separated them all out um, into to border pieces. And I'm trying to put those together. And, and I'm going at it until one in the morning. And there's one piece I cannot find. And I'm, I'm, I, I get my, my phone out, and I turn my flashlight on on my phone, and I'm leaning over the pieces on the table looking. I'm scanning to look for that, that solid edge. That didn't, that didn't turn up the piece. So then I decided, okay, I'm going I'm to physically pick up the pieces from this side, examine them, put them over here. And I'm, I'm doing this, and, and fortunately, Stacy and Ezra were both, both asleep because they would have said, what are you doing? But I'm picking them up, and I'm putting them over there. I cannot find it. And finally, it's, 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 it's one, and I've decided I'm going to go to bed. I wake up the next morning, and wouldn't you know it, within the first three minutes, I find that piece. And, and ironically, it was in the pile that I had already handled. I had physically picked up and put over here. And I was sharing this with a friend of mine, and my friend said, a fresh set of eyes are an absolute necessity when you were doing a jigsaw puzzle. And I thought, you know what, that, that is absolutely true. We can, we can look and we can scan over this, um, these puzzle pieces, and we can, we can um, miss the things. And whether it's us going away for a few hours and coming back, or having that other person who comes in the room, they're like, there it is. I don't know how you didn't see it, it was right there. Those of you who um, have that wife who is able to find the things that you look over, uh, I'm talking to the husbands, that I can be looking for, I was looking for a piece of cheese in the refrigerator last night. And I'm like, Stacy, where, where's the cheese? And she's like, right there. And, and, and I'm, I feel so stupid sometimes, but. It is what it is. That's, that's the reality of it. We as humans tend to overlook things, and sometimes we just need to come at them with a different set of eyes, a fresh set of eyes. And since this is the first Sunday of 2022, what better time to come to communion with a fresh set of eyes? I don't know if over the past couple weeks, past three months, past six months, how you have looked at communion. Hopefully it's been, you've been able to relate and, and, and it's meaningful. If it hasn't been, I would implore you to, um, today, let's take, a, let's take a little different look at, at this time in our service when we stop and we get to share in communion. You know, I, I was thinking with, um, little Benjamin up here, I thought, you know, even parents need a fresh set of eyes. You know, I, I wonder how many times Mary and Joseph, they had Jesus as that little baby, and he was just, he was doing things that kids do, but they got so frustrated with him. And I, I thought, th there have, they had to have gone through so many times of just saying, God, give me a different perspective. Give me a different perspective on this child because I know he's not, he's not a troublemaker. He's not someone who, who deserves to be punished. And, and, and we all as parents, we, those of us who are parents here or grandparents or aunts and uncles, we've experienced those children that sometimes you just want to wring their neck. But if you can, you can separate those feelings from looking at that child differently, uh, I, I know this is something that we, we've, when we've gone to graduation 
ceremonies. Stacy has said this before. She's like, I remember them when they were that little child. And it's hard to see them now as this. And I thought, this week, I thought, how many times <clears throat> did the children who grew up with Jesus as, you know, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, they're out playing. I know they didn't play, probably didn't play stickball back then, but they, they played some game. And then now, when, <clears throat> when it finally, at, at the end of 30-plus years, they see Jesus hanging on the cross, they think, wow, that, that was the same guy. And yet, I never really knew or noticed what he did, is doing for me now. And I think even at the time that he was crucified, people didn't really recognize the significance of what Jesus was doing. You know, I believe it probably started hitting them when he arose from the, from the grave. So this morning, as we partake of these emblems of communion, with the bread representing his body, which was given for us, and the blood, the juice, which represents his blood, which was shed for us, all so that we, who may have looked at him as something different at one time, now we can look at him as this person, this child of God, who God himself, who came and lived here on earth, experienced the same things, the same frustrations, the same um, excitement, the different things that we experience as, as individuals, but he chose to die for us on the cross so that we could have eternal life and we could have our sins forgiven. So this morning as we, as we partake, I just, I just hope that maybe if you've struggled in the past with having a, a fresh perspective on communion, I hope that perhaps this morning you can have that fresh set of eyes as we go into 2022. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the forethought that you had. Um, you knew that when, when uh, you brought humans on, onto the earth that you knew that we were going to need, we were going to need saved. And you didn't do it just with the snap of a finger. You did it through the life of your son. That he came and, and, and he lived a life that we could, even though we weren't there, others were there and they saw, you know, he, he's a man. But then there was something that changed um, in their perspective when he went to, went to the cross and gave up his life for us. For us who really, if, if we boil it down, we, we don't deserve what Jesus did for us. But yet he did it willingly um, because he saw and you saw the big picture. The picture that we were going to need to be saved from our own sin. And you also saw that that was the only hope of us being able to to spend eternity with you. So this morning, Jesus, I pray that as we partake of this communion, that we would reflect back upon this gift that you gave to us and that we would um, in, in some way be changed and be excited as a result of it today. It's in your name that I pray, amen.
place where the heart is undefined Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire when all my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world Cause I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing name but the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all so come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be alone and I know Joy come every battle, so I know that.
that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be You guys can go ahead and be seated, and kids, you are dismissed.
Good morning. I'm going to pray um, for us today, and then we're going to get started. Uh, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, I thank you for the fact that we get to be um, here today. God, I am grateful that you have loved us so incredibly. God, you've given us uh, everything in your son, Jesus. And God, I, I, it's interesting because when, as we come off from Christmas time where it seems it's become more about the celebration of what we are giving to one another than what you've given to us. And we roll into kind of a new year with all these desires to be different, these desires to do things differently, to be something that we weren't last year maybe or uh, whatever it is, God, that we kind of have on our hearts. I pray that you'd help us to uh, listen to you. I pray um, as we look at these different things that can be stumbling blocks or stepping stones, God, that we would be wise, uh, that we would seek your um, input, that we would seek your face today, that we would not overlook your presence this morning. God, we need it. I need it. I pray that you would speak uh, to my heart and through my heart, and I pray that we would be um, willing to be humble. Uh, God, you are good and gracious. Thank you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. How many of you have a favorite animal? Have had a favorite animal in the past? Is it dog or cat? Anybody cat? Raise your hand if it's a cat. Ferret? Skunk? Raccoon, turtle, <laughs> anything like this. My favorite all-time animal that we've ever had in my life was a dog named Pooh Bear. How many of you guys ever met Pooh Bear, remember Pooh Bear? A few of you? That The number's getting lower and lower and lower the longer we go here. But Pooh Bear was an incredible dog uh, because he was so good with our kids. Um, they were young when we had him. He was about uh, 90 to 100 pounds, maybe, I don't know, is that how big he was, Kathy? Somewhere in there, he was a chow and a golden retriever mixed. He was so gentle and so wonderful, and, and, and even, I think, our friends even loved Pooh Bear. He was such a good dog, faithful, faithful dog. And, um, but he had a problem, he had an issue. And the issue that he had was that he was codependent. Uh, and what I mean by that is, no matter where you were at in the house, he had to be there. And I recognized it for me about probably five, six, seven years in to having the dog. And uh, I just remember one time realizing that everywhere we went in the house, he'd, he'd follow us. And uh, I remember some friends were over and I said, watch this. And so we sit down and there's the dog, bam, right there. And we get up and I said, come, everybody just come in here, kitchen, for no reason. In the kitchen, we're all in the kitchen and here he comes, lays down. And then we all go over here to the, every single place we went, there's that dog and there's that dog. And he would not, one time did he not follow us to where we're at, completely dependent upon us. He wanted to be around us. He was a people dog. Great dog. Great blessing. Great blessing. <clears throat> the part of the problem of his codependency was that he wanted to be close to you. And so he would literally set up right behind our feet and he'd lay down right behind us. And so if you moved to go get up from the table, he would get up, he would quietly follow you, you go to the dishes or to where the sink is at, put your dishes in there, and he'd lay down right behind you without you knowing it. And I don't know how many times Kathy or I tripped over top of that dog, it was so infuriating, it was like he was doing it on purpose. It's like he's saying to the cat, hey, watch this, they're gonna trip over me, I bet they trip over me, and he'd line up, 
quietly right behind you and you would stumble and fall and trip over that dog. I, I want you to grab on to a truth this morning for this year ahead. And, and here it is. Have you ever noticed how great things can become horrible things if they're in places that they should not be? Let me say it again. It's really important. Have you ever noticed how good things, great things even, can become horrible things when they're in the places that they're not meant to be? I want you to think about that this week. I want you to think about that in your life. Good things that you love, that you want, that you're excited that you have in your life, good things can become horrible things if they're in the wrong place in your life. We're talking about several different things at the beginning of this year that are not necessarily bad things, things that can be stepping stones for our life and also stepping stones for a great year ahead. But those very same things can be stumbling blocks and actually make this next year one of the roughest years that you've ever had. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Something that somebody else might have in their life, and they're succeeding with it, and they're doing great with it, and you think, wow, and you've got the same thing, and, and for some reason it's so troubling to you, and it's such a stumbling block to you. Why does that happen? We're looking at five things that our choices will determine whether or not they're a stumbling block to us or a stepping stone for this next year. So uh, we started last week and we're taking five weeks and we're looking at five different things that could be one or the other, right? That could be a stumbling block, a stumbling stone, but they also could be something that will elevate your life, something that will bless your life, something that will be good for your life. And so this last week, we talked about possessions. Wouldn't you agree with that truth, that possessions uh, can be the greatest stepping stone, the greatest boost in your life, the thing that you need, possessions, right, can be so great. But those same possessions can be the very thing that weight you down, that overwhelm you and take you on paths you shouldn't be on. And last week we talked about these possessions, and I, I, I just feel convicted to say this again. Uh, maybe it's something we need to hear again. Possessions, God is not against possessions or money or, or any of those things. It's there, to have things, it, it's not anti-God to have things or to have money. It's anti your walk with God to love them, to put them in the wrong place in your life. This week, I want to talk to you about position. You know, like, like a position that you hold in life. You, maybe you're a store clerk, or maybe you're a business owner, or maybe you're a mom or a dad, or maybe you, you all hold positions in life. And your position in this world can be a blessing for the year ahead, or it actually can be a stumbling block. And I want to take a look at that. You have to choose. You're, you're actually the one who decides whether your position in this world is a stepping stone or a stumbling block. Too many people blame their issues in life with their position. Your position in life, the positions that you have in life, they're not the problem. It's what do you do with them? What do you do with the positions that you have? You could be the most powerful person in the world and have millions of people underneath you. Or you could be a grunt with no one underneath you and no one answering to you. But you still have a position that God has given you that's from God for his use and for his glory. Even if you don't like that position, there's a lot riding on what you choose to do with the positions that you hold in this life. That's what I want to, this really, that's the, the bulk of the conversation today. Is what are you going to do 
with the positions that God gives you in this life. Uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke 18, Jesus tells a story that's very relevant actually for our dialogue today. Luke 18, starting in, in verse 9, it, it's, I, I actually have been enamored with this story um, ever since I read it. It's kind of consumed me over the last couple days. It's such a good story. And it's so powerful. I want to read it to you. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, thank you. I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector that was there, right, the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to, to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you the truth, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. To me, this is just an incredible message. It, it, there's so much there. And, and, and I want to pass along a few things for you to think about in light of this year. You can have so many thoughts of, man, I want this year to be different. I want my next day to be different. I want my next week to be different. Oh, God, help me to be different. I just want to be different. You, you, you can want to be different all you want, and, and I think that we make so many uh, these resolutions and so many of these, these, these promises and these ideas, and then we burn out throughout the year, right? I think in this story, it really has a lot to share that we should consider as we look into this next year especially as it relates to your positions in this world. Some of you hold many different hats, right? You have a lot of different positions. We do. And the question really is, is what are we doing with those positions? In the wrong place, in the wrong place, in the wrong location, handled wrong, they're quite a stumbling block. But put in the right place and being faithful in giving glory to God, they can really be a stepping stone, these positions that we hold this year. So here's the first thing that I just want to pass along to you. And I need you to hang with me on this because I know that I'm coming at a different angle with this entire message in the scripture. So just bear with me and I want you to think this is kind of, I guess, maybe part of my goal today or part of my calling today is to just start a conversation with you that you continue with God throughout this week. And so if you're looking for some complete thoughts, maybe today you're not going to get them. Maybe today's just a start of a conversation between you and God, and maybe that's what you needed. Here's the first thing that I started thinking about. <clears throat> Self-righteousness will never let your position in life be used for God. Let me say it again. Self-righteousness will never let your position in life be used for God, at least not fully. Here, here's why. See, if you're a self-righteous person... Your position in life is too valuable 
and needed to keep up the appearance of righteousness that you yourself have established in your life. So, so you get that. Self-righteousness will never allow your positions in this world to be for God's glory because you need them to keep the, the appearance up of your righteousness. Your position is, is going to be used for your righteousness in this thing that you've established by yourself for your own life. A position held in this world used for God's glory is always a blessing and it's always a stepping stone. A position in this world used for God's glory, used for his light, used for him is always a blessing, even if it doesn't feel good. Even if it doesn't financially turn out well for you necessarily. If it's for God's glory, then it'll be a blessing, it'll be a stepping stone. However, a position held in this world for your glory and for your own righteousness will always eventually be a stumbling block to your life. Right? Our, our text says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable to them. You know, and for reading this, and I'm sure, I hope, You'll read this this week. I couldn't stop going into the parable. I couldn't stop going into the parable. And I had the hardest time trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to share? What are you sharing with me? And God's like, stop going into the parable. Don't move beyond what I'm saying, the whole reason why I'm sharing the parable. I'm sharing it to all of you who are confident of your own righteousness. And I read this, I was challenged, honestly, with a question. That, uh, I didn't like the answer to it, this question. But it needed to be asked. And without me allowing the question to be asked to me, I realize that I can't ask you very many questions today, can I? So the question I felt when I read this is, is man, am I self-righteous? Was Jesus talking to me? And my answer is yes. I think so. I think he's talking to me. Man, is that humbling. See, I think a part of our human nature is to try to save ourselves. I think it's natural to be self-consumed and at times and overconfident, right? Confidence is not a bad thing. It's easy to celebrate your own acts, right? Take them for your own righteousness and start believing that they're enough to justify your life, no matter what life you're living. See, it's interesting because no matter what, how we're living, we tend to try to do enough good things, right, to make the scale balance out, right? Right? Enough righteous acts to counterbalance the unrighteous acts or to counterbalance how we feel or what, right? And we get into this whole argument of our own self-righteousness, trying to save ourselves. We can even start believing that we are the ones to blame for our various positions that we hold in life. 
as if God couldn't take them away in a heartbeat. I had to realize, I, this is the conclusion I came up with, I had to realize that my flesh wants God's credit. And as I asked the question, Jesus, am I the one that you're talking about? Am I the Pharisee? I like to fancy myself as a tax collector. Oh, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. But am I more like the Pharisee? I started doing some research on self-righteousness. I came up with um, a bunch of lists and all these different things. I made up what I think are the top five signs of self-righteousness. Listen, one, self-righteous people love the praise and approval of others. Self-righteous people are uncompassionate, critical, and condemning of others. Self-righteous people, number three, struggle accepting correction. Number four, self-righteous people think of themselves as unrealistically important. Aren't we all important in some way? But sometimes when you get a little touch of self-righteousness, you can start inflating this position that you have in life. You can start having this unrealistic importance of yourself a little bit. Five, self-righteous people use their good deeds to elevate themselves. You know, as I wrestled with what Jesus said and this common human issue of self-righteousness, I came to a conclusion, and my conclusion is one I need to pass along to you, because maybe you will be confronted like I am. Confession is our only hope against self-righteousness. God, this is me. Help. This is me. But by the grace of God, there go I. This is my Achilles. This is my flesh against you, Spirit. Confession is our only hope against self-righteousness. Denial is like putting fertilizer on that self-righteousness in our life. Letting it grow like wildfire. Every single one of you, every one of us this year, we're going to hold many different positions. And I just want you to be careful because self-righteousness will turn your positions into stumbling blocks. Ask God to help you see that Jesus is the only righteousness you have. Jesus is the only righteousness you have. It's a borrowed righteousness. It's something you can possess because he gives it to you. And his righteousness dwells inside of you. But it's him that is our righteousness. Ask God to help you see that. That you'd see that Jesus is the only hope. And really, quite honestly, Jesus is the only reason for our positions that we hold in this world. Another thought that I want to share with you today is this. Jesus put two things together. Self-righteousness and looking down on others. Is that a coincidence? Is that like a mistake? Why did he choose those two things to go together? To those of you who are confident of your own righteousness and always look down on others, why did he put those two things together? Self-righteousness is, I think, at its basic thing. Some, it's very, very human, right? We can understand that. And, and we all struggle, I think, to some degree with it. But if left unconfessed as a sin, it will grow into an ugly, consuming monster. And, and the crazy thing is, in order to sustain self-righteousness, you're going to eventually need to beat other people down. Do you know that? In order to sustain your self-righteous 
position in this life, you're going to eventually need to beat other people down. That's why he put them together. Because in beating other people down, always looking down on other people, it's the only way to keep this true, this lie alive, I guess, that, that, that we, want to, we want to be right about, which is that we are righteous without Jesus, that we're just fine. Oh, I'm just fine because look at that person. I'm just fine because look at that person. Well, I'm, I, I'm okay because look at the other people around me. Self-righteousness and a critical spirit will always go hand in hand. One feeds on the other and both grow from the presence of the other. Self-righteousness and criticalness, they grow off from one another. They're needed for the other one to survive, right? See how it goes together. Jesus didn't make a mistake in saying this. So do you have a critical spirit? Is it fed by fear? Is it a momentary thing? Is it a, does it happen just when you're in a bad mood? When, when do you have a, a critical spirit? Is it by failure, insecurities? Why? Is, is, it, is your critical spirit fed by lack of confession between you and God of your weakness? Is, is it fed from you trying to be someone or something that you're not? Righteous apart from Jesus? Listen, the positions you hold this year are not strong enough to be your righteousness. That's not what their purpose is. And holding on to these positions and, and, and allowing your positions to, to give you leverage to be critical over top of other people to make yourself feel better that cannot be sustained either. Jesus speaks such powerful words to you who are confident of your own righteousness and always look down on others. Pay attention. Pay attention. Last thing I want to share with you is actually what Jesus closed the message with. He says, for all of you who exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. He closes this message, you know. I, I don't know what the disciples or what the people around Jesus at the time were gathering, gaining from this, but it had to be pretty incredible. To all of you who are confident of your own righteousness and always look down on one another. Let me tell you this parable, right? Two men, they go in and they pray and the one guy says, man, am I glad I'm not like every other loser around me. Boy, me, however, God, I do all these things for you. And then there's this other guy over here that won't even lift his eyes to heaven. And he says, oh God, forgive me. I'm such a horrible sinner. And out they go. And Jesus is like, that man, that man went away justified before my Father in heaven. See, because all who, all who would elevate themselves, you're going to be humbled. But those of you who will come humble, you're going to be elevated. Great things are going to happen. I want you to understand, as you roll into this next year, that humility is the key to everything. If you forget everything else that I said, you, you forget about my dog, Pooh Bear, and whatever else I've said today, don't forget this, that humility is the key to everything. No matter what position you hold in this world, humility is a difference maker. 
It is the difference maker. See, you can become popular in your positions, but what cost are you gaining popularity in your positions? What cost are you rising in your positions? What, what is it costing everybody else around you? Humility is the very thing that allows God to come in and say, now let me take you somewhere this year. See, your position, it sure can be a blessing, and God can do a lot with it if it's for his glory. But if your position in this world is actually about your fame and your success and what you need, pay attention. As you, as you look around and you see other people that have the same exact position or things that you have and you see them succeeding and you're just not, I want you to recognize that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. A humble person, listen, and this is really the end of the message. A humble person will recognize that their position with God is more than any position, more important than any position they can hold in this world. Have you lost sense of north? Have you lost yourself in whatever position you have? This year is going to be different based on what you do, the choices you make with the positions that you hold in this life, in this world, in this next year. And I want to say it again. I know you heard it, but I just want to say it again. I think it's important. A humble person will recognize that their position with God matters more than any position that they can hold in this world. We're going to have an invitation, and the invitation, quite honestly, I, I have no idea what it means to you or what, it, what you're going to do with it, but it's an invitation for you to meet with God. Maybe you need to just, this is the first Sunday of the year, maybe you just need to meet with God and say, God, here I am, help me. I don't know what it is, but the musicians are going to come forward and we're going to sing a song. Uh, I don't want to tell you one more story as you think about that. My, my daughter's cars, <laughs> I say cars, <laughs> her car broke down, right? And so Silas was gracious enough. He didn't have a choice, but we took his car and <laughs> brought it to her, and uh, she got this, his car, and then his car broke down on her. And so um, this week, I had the privilege of going to Michigan City, the armpit of the world, um, Indiana, and that I'm sure it's lovely for people that live there, but if you're a stranger, you don't know anybody, it's really quite horrible to me. But maybe it was just my attitude, my spirit, but it was just a rough week. I had a little, <laughs> I love people, and so I had a few lights um, at the, in the midst of all this, and one of them was when I was actually going to uh, drive three hours from Vesterberg, Michigan, over to where my daughter's at on every back road, I stopped at a gas station to get gas. <laughs> and, and I hear, as I'm pumping my gas, I hear kaboom, this big old loud boom and bang. And I look over there and I see some guy inside the drive-in car wash backing his car up and he rammed the door. The, the door had shut behind him and he rammed it and it bowed it out and could have used you stew. The door's bowed out and he's moving forward and stopping. I'm like, what is going on? You know, and I'm like loving it, of course. I mean, some action. And I, I fill my vehicle up and then they pull out of the car wash, this old man chain smoking in his car, right? And his old feeble uh, wife gets out of the car and she walks up to the door of the car wash, and I see her, I'm like, oh, she's checking out the damage that he obviously backed into the door. And no, she's bent down, and she bent down, picked up <laughs> his windshield wiper. <laughs> so what had happened, let me tell you the rest of the story. Here's the rest of the story. She, they didn't pull in all the way. He only pulled part of the way in, and the automatic door shut down and just sheared off his windshield wiper on the back of his car, just completely sheared it off. 
It was so awesome. And then it scared him. So I think he pulled forward and then he went reversed and rammed into the door and buckled it. And it was just a mess. And I'm going, oh man, there's such a danger in being half in. Isn't there such a danger in being half committed? Being part of the way in? See, I don't know what this year is going to hold for you. I don't even know what it's going to hold for our church, what, what's going to happen in your personal life. But I, I can tell you this, a half committed person will not be in the places they want to be this year. Bad things happen when we're half sold out. So maybe this invitation is more than just meet with God, but it's maybe it's us asking God, God, help me to sell out. Help me not to hold anything back from you because I know that my possessions and my position in this world is for your glory, but if it's half for me and half for you, that's not enough, God. Half isn't enough. So maybe your decision today is what are you going to do with the invitation that God gives us, that Jesus gives us, to sell out all the way? Maybe you need to meet with God today. You're welcome to come as we sing. Please stand.
God, you're good, and it's your grace, your sacrifice, the position you gave up in heaven to come here to take our position that gives us confidence, that gives us courage, that makes what is ahead of us completely different. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to um, run into this year excited about what you want to do for your kingdom. God, there's so much and so many distractions. We're distracted by every single thing we see on the news and on the media and in, the, in everything that we're doing, God, that we miss too many times what you're doing and why you're doing it. God, our lives are for you. They're for your glory. They're so that your light can shine in this dark world. God, people are struggling in their helplessness and their hopelessness, God, is not because they don't have money. It's not because they don't have the position they want. It's not because they don't have the possession that they want. God, it's not because of anything that this world can't offer them or doesn't and is trying to offer them. God, it's because they don't have you. And so you have redeemed us to be a light to them. I pray that you'd help us, God. I pray that this year would be different, that we would run into it excited to carry your light, humbled because of your presence in our life. God, may we not run from your presence, but to it. May we remain in the vine. God, you're good and gracious. Thank you for today. Thank you for meeting with us. And I just pray that we'd have a great, uh, great year. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Have a good day.